consider. Okay, um, let's start with uh, a quick show of hands uh, of who here thinks they can define the metaverse. Don't worry, Tim Cook says you can't, so it doesn't matter if you can't. Are you going to make me define it now? One, no, one. I see one hand. Okay, Herman. Do you get sick of being asked to define what the metaverse is? <laughs> no, I think it's the single most important question to ask yourself now if you're an investor or an entrepreneur. Because if this thing is going to happen the way that the internet happened, what we can be sure of is that a great deal of money and time is going to be wasted on bullshit. Because I don't know if you guys remember the early days of the internet, but there was so much bullshit. And we're going to see the same thing happen now. And if you, if you define the metaverse in a way that includes smart TVs and Disney+, Plus, boy, are you going to be confused in what you invest in and where you go. Um, and it's, so I think it's the most important question, and, and I think it needs to be addressed. And it's the root of the discussion. OK, so what is the, me what is the metaverse not? If you just pass me the book, I can skip it. Yeah, OK. Can, no, no, no. no. Um, the, what the metaverse isn't is a, this is strange coming from a person who develops metaverse technology, but the metaverse actually has nothing to do with technology or virtual worlds as we think of 3D embodied avatar based environments. That's the, the same way that a Kindle has nothing particularly to do with what literature is, right? L literature and stories are not just the tool we happen to use today to engage with them. Um, and so too much of the discussion is about these tools because the people who are perpetuating the discussion want their stock price to go up. And they can do that if they can cause you to conflate this big, broad, important human topic with what their company happens to be making today. And this, to me, is the real danger here. And we saw this with the internet. How many companies became dot-com overnight, right? It was like somebody selling suits is now an internet company and trading at 50x the multiple. This is the danger, um, and that's, that's what I want to avoid. And so um, you've given a number of definitions over the, over the last year or two about what the metaverse actually is then. So that's not what it's not. So the problem um, that I think most people find and why you don't have many hands going up is that even someone is yourself when you're asked to define what the metaverse is, there is no one sentence answer. You speak for quite a long time trying to define what the metaverse is. I can give you the one sentence. It Go does need a bit of unpacking. This is fairly, I would say, technical in a sense. The best definition I think we can use to have a sensible conversation is the following. The metaverse, or a metaverse, as I think there are perhaps many, is a network of meaning and meaningful identities, objects, events, and experiences. And what defines the metaverse is that it's a network that connects different socially constructed realities. So as an example, sport, the world of sport, the world of football, and the sort of real world, the real social world we're living in now, that forms a metaverse. Value transfers from the world of sport to the real world. And it's also a little bit absurd, right? Because it makes absolutely no difference who wins the World Cup, but it deeply matters who wins the World Cup. You know, like it happens every couple of years. So like you could, you know, have an infinite number of tries at this thing, but it really matters. And if you want to understand where we're heading, I think looking at things like sport and fashion is more instructive than looking at video games. Because my definition focuses a lot more on that transfer of value between worlds. When you talk about those, those um, like the world of sport and how we can actually all you know, go to a sporting event without actually going to the sporting event, you actually have talked before about how um, you, you, your definition of the metaverse doesn't include virtual reality. Yet many of your examples, nearly all of your examples, are rooted in virtual reality. So to be more specific, my... Um, definitions have nothing to do with VR headsets or virtual reality as we would understand it. I do think that um, digital experiences are the new thing that are going to catalyze the, the opportunity to create new value with the notion of a metaverse. But VR headsets themselves focus on immersion, which is the idea of the world feeling more real. What's much more important is presence, which is the idea that you and the world can have a relationship. 
and interesting things can happen in that relationship. So for me, I don't think VR headsets are where we're going to mostly experience the metaverse. We're going to experience them on our phones. We're going to experience them through traditional devices like PCs. And that's really where the root of that is going to come from. OK, well, let's drill down there. So sure. when you talk about, sort of, you know, it's more about having relationships. Well, we can do that already. Can we? So, yeah. So what, so what, so what, is, dif what, you, what is different about the metaverse in terms of having those relationships, in terms of meeting people in a digital space, whether it be on a Zoom call or whether it be on a phone call or whether it be in Great. virtual reality you know you're talking about it's all about experiences and relationships well what does the metaverse offer in that is different to what we can already achieve so let's take a concrete example say you're a cricket fan in India you have a 3g phone and you've never been to Lord's cricket ground you've never actually been to a cricket match you watch cricket on TV I can give you the ability with that phone to hop into a space with 30,000 other people whose voices you can hear, with players there in the crowd that you can talk to and interact with and even express yourself with in a way that might end up being televised, in a way that allows you to be present, allows you to express your fandom, that you as a passive fan of cricket or whether you're a Manchester United fan in Southeast Asia or whatever, have never experienced. So I think if, you, if you're privileged enough to know lots of celebrities, constantly go to big, um, you know, famous events and hang out in huge crowds, perhaps the metaverse doesn't have as much to offer you today as it does other people. But if you're part of the billions of people in our society that are passive consumers of culture, that don't get to express themselves, to be there, to engage, the metaverse is really powerful. I mean, today we're talking, for example, with, um, uh, with, with certain celebrities who are tired of flying around the world for impersonal concerts and events where they don't necessarily have a relationship with their fans. Some of these people are older now. They love the idea of pulling up their laptops and having an intimate conversation and interaction with thousands of fans in, in a world where they can express themselves. The metaverse is about going from passive consumption to actively having experiences. And as I talk about in the book, those experiences are not optional. We need them to be psychologically healthy. And we don't talk enough about this. If we don't provide people with fulfilling experiences, their lives are miserable. But what you're describing to me as a layman sounds like a pimped version of virtual reality. How is it different? So virtual reality is the headset you wear to, to sort of be able to go into a 3D environment. What I'm talking about is the world that that environment allows you to experience. So let's take a number to help us understand the difference. Um, this number is called operations per second. When you play a game of Fortnite with 100 players in it, that takes 10,000 messages a second on the back end, right? So video games are kind of at that 1,000 level number. When you use WhatsApp, that service is handling about a million messages a second. In order to run the example I just gave of that cricket fan going and hanging out and everyone talking, you need to handle billions of messages per second on the back end. So what's different is not the device you use to interact with the world. That's Facebook's poisonous distraction. <laughs> What's interesting, apologies to Facebook, I know they've, they've had a harsh time recently, but um, what, what, what's interesting is the world itself, right? You know, I feel like we're talking about Narnia, and I want to have a conversation uh, generally about um, the beautiful world of Narnia, and people want to talk to me about the wardrobe you used to get there. You know, the wardrobe is not the interesting part of Narnia, that's what I would say. Okay, but that's a great question. Okay, but operation, okay op operations per second, okay. Yeah, um, Fortnite takes 10,000 operations per second. You're up to a, a billion? We're actually at publicly stated 2 billion, but privately more. How much more? Uh, <laughs> we, we've become, you know, we started off, and I, I thought I was clever when this company started. Like, oh, I have a Cambridge computer science degree. I'm intelligent, and I could understand what our product did for like the first five years. The last year of innovation, I honestly don't know how a lot of this stuff works. Okay. Some of the people who work on this, especially the machine learning aspects, is mind-blowingly cool. Okay, but we are talking, still talking about operations per second. Yeah. So instead of 10,000, it's billions. Yeah, so as an example... It still sounds like a pimped version of virtual reality to me. Well, but if you're defining virtual reality as any digital experience, sure it is. But okay, I don't well, think that's okay, okay. Would let's talk about the hardware. What yeah. sort of hardware will we be, be using? So in order to reach the most people and in order to create the best experiences. Most experiences that, are, that companies are now working with us to build are mixed experiences. So some people oh, access why they're No, no, as in um, people use various different devices to access the same world at the same time. OK, so yes, it will be virtual reality. Yes, it will be through screens. It, it'll be, a, di it'll be a, um, a digital experience, but it won't be necessarily virtual reality, as in it won't necessarily involve a headset. Okay, okay. Well, another thing that your book actually brings up, which I thought was really interesting, is this idea, this idea of the metaversal self, other jobs. 
new jobs or new economies that are created within the metaverse. Um, what sort of ones are we talking about here? Uh, and is this what um, these, um, these new chief metaverse officers have come to <laughs> Well, do. I, I, we should come on to that. We will. Really that's we will. a really good topic, and I'm glad you raised that. Um, but in terms of virtual work, what I'm arguing in the book is that the source of value in a virtual experience comes from the fact that you're having a fulfilling interaction in a rich world. And it turns out that you need other people for that to work. And you need those other people to often be playing roles in that world that are real and meaningful. So I'll take an example people might be familiar with. If you've ever played a free-to-play uh, action game online, you may notice that it's free-to-play, but the reason it's free-to-play is because uh, the you're actually doing a job, and your job is to die while the people who've paid money uh, have the opportunity to, to meet you in a matchmaking queue, so there's someone to play against. If nobody was playing, it wouldn't work because there need to be other people there. So, Take that idea further. You, know, you need a virtual bartender for your virtual bar. You need people who are able to play the role of villains or heroes in order to drive the economy of these worlds. And once you're making real money from digital asset sales, it suddenly becomes very economical to think of, let's say, 1%, 2% of players actually earning an income from inside these worlds. And 1% or 2% of a big global game, like big global games now have hundreds of millions of users. That's like a couple million jobs. Yeah. Um, and that's transformative. Yeah. What, what rights should these workers have? That's such a good question. And what I talk about a lot in the book is how we're just not set up to have a sane conversation about the legal and governance challenges. I mean, for example, if you were to have a single central company run the metaverse, that company would be responsible not only for, like, as Facebook is now, for how we communicate, but literally for our livelihoods for how we're educated. That, that cannot be something one company ever owns. And we should strive to do everything we can in our power to ensure that does not come to pass. Because you're not going to like that world. Um, if you're disappointed in this one, wait until you live in that one. Um, you know, you know that, that's great. Y your account has been suspended. Wait, what do you mean? I don't have a job anymore? And I don't have a relationship and, or any friends? No, thank you. Um, your life has been suspended. So uh, what I argue for in the book is um, we need to move towards uh, cooperative networks of, of different organizations that can share power and share value in a way that allows, um, allows different groups to be enfranchised. So, for example, our company is building um, a network called M Squared, which we do not fully own. It's actually going to be owned in partnership with all of the people building the metaverses and the users themselves. So people can't just change the rules willy-nilly. That has to be a decision we make collectively. And over time, I actually think you're going to need democracies um, in order to allow people to be fully enfranchised within virtual worlds. So interoperability, great question right here. So what you, but what you've got there with M squared is that is that when the companies come to you uh, in your new operation and basically say, okay, we want you to build um, a, a, a metaverse for us, part of the contract with M squared is that it has to be uh, uh, connected or interoperable with the other metaverses that you have. How do you break that out into the other metaverses that other companies want to create, like Facebook, for example, uh, and, and because it's, or, or, or uh, Fortnite? I mean, why would World of Warcraft let their players jump into Fortnite and then jump into um, one of your metaverses? It would only take people away from their uh, circular, their, their closed economy. So there are two separate, both great questions there. I'm going to take the first one and then come to the why would they. So in terms of how it works, the crucial thing is M squared is a protocol. So we can't exclude people from the network, and we can't prevent people from interoperating with it as long as they play by the rules of the network, which once set are set. So to answer your first question, you don't have to work with Improbable to be part of M squared, which might sound crazy, right? We're giving away our platform, but it's the best way to create a valuable network. On the second question, why would World of Warcraft uh, interoperate with other games? They wouldn't. <laughs> we're the, we're the world-leading provider of multiplayer expertise and services. Fancy way of saying our people work directly inside 60 different games publishers. And not a single one of those games publishers is, is part of our Metaverse initiative today. It's all fashion brands, sports leagues, music companies. Why? Because the idea of taking your LVMH handbag into a football match makes sense. 
the idea of bringing, bringing a machine gun into Hogwarts makes very little sense. Uh, you know, and I just don't want to see Voldemort die that way. It's just too confusing. So you, need, you have to think of the metaverse as being about related and interoperable content. This is one of the ways it's different from the internet. In the internet, everything being linked together makes sense. It's a network of information. But the metaverse is a network of experiences. It's a tapestry of meaning. You can't just willy-nilly mash things together any more than you'd be mashing religions together in the real world and expecting yeah. people to get along. Okay, well, I'm going to end my questions in a minute just because I want questions. to. Uh, we have loads of Slido questions. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, what are the what are the dangers of the metaverse? The optimism with which you speak about uh, the metaverse uh, reminds me of the optimism that Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg used to talk about Facebook when it like, as, as a, a nice online community where we can all talk to each other and be nice to each other. And well, then look how that's changed. Look, and now, so, you know, what are the dangers? Are you mindful of the dangers of what you might be creating? Look, I, I talk about this quite a lot um, in a chapter which is called The Tyrant and the Commons. And I try to explain, at least the best I can, why I think, and I'm stealing a lot of the historian Nell Ferguson's ideas here, but why we ended up in this mess to begin with. Like, I consider where we are now a sort of digital dark age. And I'm, of course, not only mindful of those challenges, I think our customers are too. Nobody wants to recreate that horror show ever again. So the first question you get asked now is, well, how are we going to avoid that? Who has control over this? Who makes decisions? How does it operate? It's all about governance. That's how we avoid this. And remember, it can work. Look at Wikipedia. Wikipedia works. Wikipedia can handle misinformation. Why can't Facebook with 50 times the, re well, thousands of times the resources? Because Facebook doesn't want to, that's why. Okay, well, last one for me then. So let's finish on a practical note for the business audience then. So like, if you're a company thinking about the metaverse, what, like, what is the toolkit they need? What sort of things they should be experimenting with right now? And this is where we bring in whether chief metaverse officers are a silly idea or not. Start with one event. If you're a brand or a company with a community, start with one event or experience. And we can, of course, help you with that, but there are others, although none of them can do what we can do yet. Um, but do an experience. Try and see how your community interacts with you, with each other, with the brand. It's all about interactive experience. So I think for a lot of companies, it's going from passively pushing messages out to people to turning it into a conversation with the community. That is the difference.